a real life example of uh, a client I've been working with for just over two years now, how we evolved their journey and their definition of Agile over that time. So first of all, I don't normally like talking a lot about me, but it's actually quite important because I have got some strong opinions about certain things in Agile myself. I'm a less friendly scrum trainer, for example, so I believe in product large uh, definitions of product, cross-functional teams, all of those good things. But when I'm working with a client, I actually try and put all of those things to one side and focus on outcomes first, uh, then what obstacles get in their way, and what hypothesis or experiments can we do to try and overcome those things? That's my model when I go into a client and that's what we did here. I'll get it out of the way. Most people know that I'm famous for being and um, dating Helen Meek, who's also known as the Kanban Queen. Couldn't be here today, too busy training, but does uh, often come. So there you go. So the client was IG Loyalty, which is a large loyalty organisation, uh, famous for working with British Airways. And a bit of context, this was right in the middle of COVID. So IG Loyalty was the only part of the organisation that was making money at this time. And that got them some interest and they got asked, well, how can we make more money? We're all losing money. How can you help us make more money? That was the context of why we were there. And the first question I always ask my clients is, well, okay, but why do you want to be more agile? What's it going to give you? For me, agile is never the goal. Uh, we're using agile techniques to meet some types of outcomes within the organization, which uh, comes next after the agreement. So this is with an executive team. So we're talking CEO, COO, um, chief commercial officer, chief financial officer and working with them on an agreement of how they want to work. All of these are Creative Commons, you can find them online after. And this works actually at all levels. This is just an example of working it with an exec team, but I would use it just the same model with teams and even individuals. And this um, helps me to remain ethical and also talk about boundaries with them. So what's in and out of scope for this work we're going to do, what we're going to do, and also visualizing our work what I like to call drinking our own champagne, to so start using the tools and techniques that we're going to use with our clients on ourselves. So what happened in the first three weeks? Chaos. It's what I call um, initial scoping. So I use a model based on Caitlin Walker's work called clean scoping, I've slightly adapted and changed it to um, agile scoping. And the first phase is initial scoping. You might call it discovery, it's a similar sort of thing. We start not knowing much about the organisation, we do lots of activities, you can read those for yourselves. We do use the agenda shift survey to look at those both quantitative and qualitative data. So quantitative data using the agenda shift survey, qualitative data then supported by doing clean interviewing, small workshops, both some open and some that we've directed for a certain purpose. At the end of that, we're keeping people ongoing as we go, leadership meetings every week. So this is a real story of what happens when leadership really get engaged in the change. And the support that that gives you and the catalyzing effect that that can have for any organization. Um, I have a rule that I'll only work with organizations where I can speak and influence at that area. Um, I really uh, like Agile coaches that are patient enough to not have that support and stay in that environment where they can influence that piece, um, but I won't do it anymore uh, for my own sanity. Um, what I would say is if you are going to not have that influence, really think about the scope of the work that you can use and do and the influence you can have off the back of that, especially in that coaching element. So this is whole org. It doesn't matter, but the whole point of the scope is choose your scope wisely and within the influence and control that you've actually got uh, uh, enabled to do so. Okay, so here were the outcomes that we had. Uh, it doesn't really matter what the outcomes are, but the point here is that we're working with the organization, we've done some discovery. Uh, as a group, they've d then defined their four highest priority outcomes that they're looking for. And uh, at this start, we've actually used auditory perspective measures, which basically means what will you see or hear in six months' time that's not happening now? And this is because the organization didn't have any other measures to really gauge at the start. 
Um, so the only thing we could do is, okay, well, what we're going to see out here in six months' time, what will it be like then that it's not like now? And that's where we started from. You'll see some measures as we go on where we progressed this and got better at actually having some more scientific measures. But we've got classic things, you know, our way of working, clear prioritization, seamless workflow, with some words underneath that people could get excited about, that people understood, and we shared this with the entire organization. Okay, so this was IGL, how it was organized when I first started. Fairly traditional, so they had something that they called the Spotify model. Don't know if any of you have come across that in this room. Very small product teams, uh, lots of dependencies across teams in this model, and the rest of the organization um, hadn't really done much in an agile way, and it was actually cr creating quite a division in the organization. So we had these product teams that would say, we're not doing this because we're agile. By the way, when that is said, a fairy dies. I didn't know if you, you knew that, a fairy does die when you say that's not agile. Um, and it was creating this division between the rest of the organization and these agile product teams. And so one of the main things that they brought me in to do is to get rid of those silos, uh, think about how we can do this as a whole organization, not just kind of an IT product space, uh, and bring them all on that journey together. So the hard work began, again, drinking our own champagne. So having a visualization board of the work we we're going to do, the experiments that we were going to try next, and the outcomes that we were looking for. And um, I think after about three weeks, I was meant to go back to the exec team with a PowerPoint presentation. And I said, no, I'm not giving you a PowerPoint presentation. Here's our board. Go and look at it. We'll, we've got these fancy labels which will show you what experiments we're trying against the outcomes that we've agreed. And that's what we'll use in our meetings going forward. And they all looked at me like this for a while. And then, kind of, OK, yeah, you, you, know, you sometimes talk sense, John. I don't think they said that very often, but that was one of the times, for sure. And then, at the same time, we had a discussion around, well, what Agile coaching capability have we got in this organization? They had something called like, Agile delivery managers or leads that were doing more of a delivery role, but nothing that was covering Agile coaching. And I'm differentiating, and this is where I've been a bit naughty, do you need an Agile coach? Well, my answer is no, but you do need Agile coaching capability within your organization. This is the Agile coaching growth wheel, the latest iteration, only out last week. And we have a, ooh, yeah, only out last week. Uh, released at the Scrum Gathering in Portland. Uh, have a look if you haven't seen it before. And these are all the competencies I believe you need in your organization in order to help and support it to be agile. So instead of having a permanent agile coaching role, this organization decided, well, we're going to have 12 people who we're going to uh, create this capability internally, and they're all going to do it kind of half of this job as well as carrying on with their other job. So you could argue not ideal, but what it did was it spread the capability across the organization, it meant that we could keep uh, increasing and improving our capability quite quickly, and it didn't cost the organization anything, so they didn't have to spend any more money on new hires at the start. You know, really thinking about the Kanban principle of start from where you are. Not that I know anything really about Kanban, apart from what Helen tells me, but I'm, really I'm more of a scrum person. But she tells me that's a good idea, and so I thought, well, I'll give that a go and we'll see how it goes. So, first thing was actually quite interesting. So I said, well, what's your strategy? I said, we haven't really got a strategy. It's like, well, you know, I can't really do my work until we have a strategy. So first thing I had to do with them was actually help and support them to define their strategy. And they created a strategy, some values, enablers. I wasn't allowed to tell you what those are. They're apparently too kind of business critical for you to know what the enablers are. Apart from Agile Embedded was one of them. And uh, we had quite a lot of measures of success there as well, which I'm not allowed to share. And then what did we decide? Oh, I heard a gasp in the audience. I thought I'm keeping the sponsors nice and happy today because I'm talking about flight levels and later on I'm talking about actionable agile as well. So there we go. So yeah, they said, well, we've got a real problem because um, we've got all of these things in flight at the same time and um, we keep changing our mind of what's really important and what should we do. And people don't know why we're changing or what's going on. 
So I said, well, I've heard about this thing called flight levels. Um, why don't we start with that and create a strategy board? So I asked Helen how to do a strategy board, and she said, well, something like this. So I went back to the organization. We spent a lot of time, had a few workshops, and uh, came up with quite a simple strategy board. We had capabilities at the top, but really key, all linked to that strategy and the outcomes that the organization was looking for. So you could fully track from the initiatives that they were deciding to do, which were scored by an independent uh, leadership team, against their strategic outcomes and their strategy overall all viewed by the entire organization um, and some data to back it up of where we we're at which was reported to the entire organization in their weekly meetups all of the time so the whole organization started using this board to drive decisions and to use as information so this wasn't just for a couple of people this was viewed every week by the entire organization and the leadership team actually in their weekly meetings used to go through this uh, as well. So the data is not very exciting at the start, you know, these are quite big things, uh, quite high numbers, took a long time to baseline and get those information. Um, but what I did and what I was proud of was we managed to actually reduce their work in progress limit at the strategy level from 25 initiatives to 14 within about six months. Just by having those conversations, visualizing it, them seeing it as read every week, understanding the challenges of having too many of these large things in progress across your organization and trying to drive that down over time. It stayed about static at that. We think that's about right for the organization now. Uh, WIP limit is 15 on that uh, board. So 15 big initiatives for the entire organization is the maximum that they'll have. Otherwise, um, I said that red was bad, but apparently it's not. You're meant to be curious and ask, hmm, I wonder what's caused you to go over that work in progress limit and then take it from there. So we have those conversations if it goes over. And uh, around this strategic board, started to create cadences where we're having challenges. So they created what they called a triage and prioritization team. Um, which was a big step for them. Before this, the C team made all of the decisions about what was happening and no one else found out any information. So what they did was created a cross-functional team at the next level below, so like middle managers, um, a person from each department who met weekly to have those conversations, reprioritize those strategic pieces, talk about any new initiatives coming through, um, through discovery, through shaping, uh, into delivery. Um, and I already talked about organization going through it at least once a month and SLT starting to use this in their weekly meetings in their different areas as well. So really became the heartbeat of the organization. Then we, that was going quite well and they said, well, we still got these challenges because we keep getting all these dependencies across the teams and the portfolio has helped us a bit because now we know like which one we should be going on because before people would say, well, we're working on this initiative and they would say, well, we thought this was the highest priority. So we stopped that. But then there were some more challenges. So I took one of their more complicated flows, which was onboarding of new partners, and I said, well, there's this other part of flight levels, which is called level two, where we can coordinate multiple teams across this. And we did the same at this level. But you can see there's a lot more swim lanes at this level. Now, I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing. In fact, this was after many hours of coaching. They wanted more, because this is like a huge flow. So before this was an 80-page document that outlined the process to go from a partner saying they wanted something to getting them on board. And we managed to get it down to, I can't remember how many columns, maybe you know, 14, something like that by the end. You can see nicely visualized. I've had to obviously blur out the work for confidentiality. But you can see how visualizing that work, having a cadence around it, so all of the teams would have a clear understanding of where things are at. Things were getting blocked when they needed to get blocked. Things were getting escalated to the right levels when they needed to get levels. And we all lived happily ever after. Until the dependencies got a bit of a pain in the butt. And so they said, well, what can we do now, John? So you've, you've given us all these tools. We're able to visualize. Um, we can see where the challenges are. I said, well we may have to use the S word. Think about structure. So we used all of the data 
that we'd got from these flight levels. We created a flight plan uh, with all the flight paths in there that are being used. We said, well, what can we do to change how we're structured in order to reduce the number of dependencies? So we thought, well, what's an experiment we can try? So we restructured just one area first. Thought, oh, yeah, this works quite well. That's made us a bit quicker. We looked at our data within Actionable Agile and it said, oh, yeah, that's quite good, that. We'll do a bit more of that. And then they did a larger restructure to try and uh, create less of these dependencies across these teams uh, and to align closer to kind of the idea of products or value streams as you might be used to. This was kind of a year in. So this is a year's worth of work at just collecting data, being that mirror to the organization uh, until they got into a position where they were like, yeah, yeah, we understand now, John. We better do something about this. So what else did we do that was uh, pretty interesting, or at least I think it was, was they kept going on about playbooks. So we didn't follow any particular um, framework. So some teams may have been doing some Scrum-like activities. Um, I haven't met yet team, a team yet that does Scrum by the book, so Scrum-like activities. Uh, some teams were doing Kanban-like activities. Again, loose term of Kanban. Uh, that most of us uh, know and love. Um, and we wanted to actually empower the teams as much as possible to work in as an agile way as they wanted. But some of these challenges were causing us problems with consistency, especially at the coordination level around cadences, heartbeats, when things were getting done. And so we came up with this idea of being principle-led. So we came up with these high-level ways of work, and it's like, okay, well, where do we want to be consistent? And we said, well, collaboration, prioritization, uh, how we measure team health, which includes kind of all of your um, actual agile results, all of that sort of thing, technical excellence. Um, and there's also a couple of processes as well. We try to avoid those as much as possible. So they were more kind of step-by-step -step kind of pieces, more of the things in the simple domain that are things that you just kind of need to do on a day-to-day -day basis. And then we did some workshops to decide, OK, well, what do we mean by collaboration? What are the principles that we want all our teams to follow when we're collaborating? And we agreed those. And then we said, OK, well, what practices are the teams using in order to collaborate? And we had a list of those, again, giving people guidance and instructions, but not dictating at the team level how the team should work. It was down to them. As long as they followed the principles, then they could actually f do whatever practices for them. <laughs> yeah. So I did say that I was going to also tell you some of the things that went wrong. So this is my favorite team. This was actually a marketing team. So we hadn't managed to get marketing fully embedded in all of the teams at this point. And um, we talk about being a mirror to the organization. Shout out anyone who uh, can see anything that might be a little bit dodgy with this team right now. Whip limits. Yeah. What's the whip limit on this team? Yeah, 194 items in progress. Has anyone ever beaten that, 194 items in progress? It's pretty impressive, right? It's pretty... You've beaten it? How many? 222. Any advance on 222? <laughs> the cycle time, bearing in mind this is a marketing team who should be able to respond to change. They're getting data in all of the time about what... Uh, marketing experiments are working or not, had a cycle time of 61 days. That was actually uh, lead time, not cycle time. It's, it might in Kanban University terms, but I don't know how actionable agile measure that. But this was from something joining the queue to it being uh, you know, done, yeah, as opposed to when they've started the work. Um, and they were still adding more things to it. So arrival rate was still higher than throughput. So it's like, this work is never going to end. And even if you added nothing else right now, it's going to take you 256 days or less with an 85% certainty. Is that OK? And they kind of just went, well, yeah, we're quite happy with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, yeah, yeah, well, we're quite happy with that. And so at that point, it's like, I know how to pick my battles, right? So I'm like, OK. Well, here's the data, here's how you can use it, keep looking at it, think about how you want to work with this information, and if you want my support in future, 
come back to me. And you know, about three months later, they said, John, this is really starting to cause a lot of stress now. Uh, please, can you help? So we managed to then start to do a little bit of work with them. But there's no point keep forcing and pushing yourself on uh, a person, a team, or an organization that don't want your help. Our job is to be that mirror, provide that information, and if this information specifically isn't enough to cause some sort of change, then you're probably onto a losing battle right there. So just move on, is my advice. So, we then start to get more into these measures and really think about, well, if this Agile thing is going to be a success, what are the measures that we want to attain? And we kind of put them into three different sections. We've got the business metrics, so the most important ones, I think, profit, at least for this organization. Most organizations care about profit, not all, but most. Profit and Avios earned redeemed. Then some more uh, leading indicators around efficiencies, delivery time, waste, that sort of thing. And then they also really were doing a push for recruitment. So colleague engagement was really um, an important thing here. Stop losing uh, staff. In the first kind of six months, actually, we had quite a lot of high turnover from the change that we'd implemented. Uh, and then that kind of changed by the second year. We started being able to hire more uh, people that we needed. So what difference did it make? Given in mind that this was in COVID, this was the scorecard at the end of the year. As you can see, most things were green. The only one that wasn't was IG's MPS, which we have no control over, which we're trying to change to be something a bit more uh, tangible for IGL. Uh, but you can see all the things within IGL's control are actually green. And they did that during kind of one of the most volatile times within the airline's history. It's pretty awesome. Colleague engagement surveys went up 7%, as I said, with that dip to start with, but we actually increased employee engagement by seven points. Cycle time started to reduce slowly over time. Um, and we also got some of that somatic kind of view of what was going on within the organization. Not everything was great. They did have still a little bit of an obsession with JIRA boards. Now, I'm going to say this really quietly. I did actually find JIRA okay by the end. And that's because I'd got in early enough, I'd kept it really simple, uh, I'd taken out all of these complex workflows and all of that stuff and just kept it as simple as possible and, and it helped me get that data out from Actual Agile, so it was actually okay. But don't tell anyone I ever said that, because yeah. I'll lose all of my credibility that I may or may not have had. Uh, but they did get a bit tool obsessed, so we needed to do a bit of work on that to say, it's not about the tool, it's about your ways of working, it's about these principles we've defined, the tool could be anything. Um, so there was a bit of that, especially in the non-tech teams, I would say. Uh, they kind of had that as their safety blanket, especially with the... Um, reporting that we were getting out of there as well, which was being used by the entire organization. And there's some kind of not so good things that we struggled with. The main one being the interaction with other opcos, operational companies, like the partners that we're trying to do with. You can only be as agile as the least agile part of your stream, is the rule that I learned from Evan Laybon. Um, and so when you're interacting with other partners that aren't as agile as you, that's going to limit your ability yourself. We had a number of other buildings, so the strategy board was um, really good at driving those decisions around prioritization and capacity. That middle management, some people call it the frozen middle, the permafrost. If you think that and believe that, then that will be true. We need to really go to them with compassion, understanding they're in a difficult position, and engage them from the start. Evolving this flavor of Agile as we went, so not going for that prescribed framework really helped us. Um, we already talked about the measures and how you can get those early on that really struggled to show the impact and difference that we'd had throughout. Uh, we, got, we had some challenges as well, especially with the opcos as we talked about. Uh, we needed that restructure, I would have liked it a bit earlier. And you've, this, it's a constant, the reason why I use the word ev evolution and not transformation is because it's constant. 
It's relentless. It never ends. We're constantly looking to evolve and change. Even if you're the best today, you won't be tomorrow. There's no such thing as best practice. There's only good practice. We're constantly looking at how we're evolving the work that we do. So, do you need agile coaches? We did in the end, yeah, we hired a couple of Agile coaches. But once we'd understood what it meant and what type of Agile coaches we needed, what they were going to do, if we'd have hired them right at the start, then we might have hired the wrong type of Agile coach that we needed, um, and that would have led to having people in the wrong size or shape for what we wanted. So don't rush into these decisions. There's other ways to do it, uh, but probably if you want to be an ultra organization in the end you will need some agile coaches so any questions how long we got actually i have so many questions so i try to to narrow down to okay good so you're doomed um <laughs> the first question is you mentioned a square with capacity and that could lead to any possible conversation so quickly how did you manage to get the organization get the idea of how to measure the capacity. And the second one is, for that challenging team, the marketing one, how did you manage to get the data so that you could get the evidence? Because possibly they were not so collaborative in providing you data. Uh, so capacity, uh, we guessed. So just put a finger up in the air. Started with a higher work in progress limit and just reduced it over time, having those conversations, like can we get it lower? Can we get it lower? Can we get it lower? So it was an incremental kind of reduction to that point. Uh, with that team, um, they were actually obsessed with using JIRA. So you saw they had that work in progress limit of like 140 things. And so the great thing about the Actionable Agile plugin, and honestly, I'm not on commission, speak to them downstairs, is that it will just pull the data out of any project and then I can do whatever I want with it and show them it. Uh, it's really quite simple to use. Not plugging actual Agile, but a question about it. Did the organization already have it in place, or was that something you had to try and pitch? Yeah, I had to get... And how'd you go about that? Um, well, I knew we needed something that did metrics, and I wanted something simple, um, and Jira doesn't have anything built in, so... I think we trialed like two or three different tools um, and this one seemed to be the simplest and easiest to use. So um, to be honest, because it's this organization is around 500 people, so I don't tend to work with really large organizations. For me, I'm not patient enough um, to see the change come through. Again, these rules that I have around the organizations I want to work with. Uh, and so getting that then agreed was not really a big problem. Um, we'd, we'd already got that C type team um, kind of involved and they wanted to know the measures. Um, so it wasn't really a problem. Last question. Last question, anyone? You're going to make me run. Okay. Uh, so that was why did the team that went away for three months come back to us? Um, I think it's a bit of FOMO, right? So you've got other organizations, parts of the organization that are getting a lot of kind of credit and value for the work they're doing. And this team over here, and, and it's starting to cause them more problems and longer, you know, they were working really long hours. It wasn't a sustainable thing that they were doing. Then um, eventually it kind of, they come around to, yeah, perhaps we can try a few things, John. I was... So it was a whole organization and just me and one kind of grad that I was kind of helping and supporting. It wasn't like, you know, it's like, oh, well, if you don't want me, there's like a whole rest of an organization to, to go to. So it wasn't like I had to sit there. I would go to where I thought I could add the biggest impact to the outcomes. So every decision I made at any point was, do I think this is going to help me reach the outcomes that this organization wants? If yes or no, and prioritizing and reordering my hypotheses in that kind of way, trying to enable the organization to do it for themselves as much as possible. Okay, I think we're out of time, but I'm around for the next day and a half, so please ask me any questions. <laughs>